Exploring Idaho, the monthly adventure showcasing our state's unique people and places, is brought to you by Albertsons, your local Ford dealers, West One Bank, Idaho Department of Commerce, seven regional travel committees, and KTVB, Channel 7. Let your favorite chair become a front row seat to adventure as we take you Exploring Idaho. and welcome to this special edition of Exploring Idaho. During the next hour, we're going to take you to some of our favorite places, places we visited during the first season of the show. You know, Idaho is a great place for all kinds of recreation, and I'll bet before the hour is through, you'll find at least one adventure you'd like to try. Spring, it's a great time in Idaho. It's the time of year when everything simply bursts to life. It's also the time of year when most of us are looking for any excuse to get outdoors. We found a pretty good excuse. We met a man on the Salmon River who lives for springtime, and he's itching to share it with the rest of Idaho. Because, as he says, not many people get to see what you're about to see. deep green of the ponderosa pines to the lime green grasses, the Salmon River comes alive this time of year. I think that there are opportunities uh, on the salmon in the springtime that you don't get any other time of year. One is of course the wildflowers. April is the time for wildflowers here. The canyon is green and not just green, I suppose an artist might be able to describe that particular shade of green, I, the best I can do is to call it spring green. It's brilliant. The spring rebirth brings colorful wildflowers, breathtaking waterfalls, and an abundance of wildlife. Mixed in with the obvious beauty of the canyon is what a lot of folks will travel across the state and around the world for. And for those who have joined river guide Wayne Johnson on his annual trek down this famous river, it brings adventure along with the solitude. Spring on the salmon is a well-kept secret. Everybody forward. Good run. Hold your paddles. Nothing to it. Springtime trips must be carefully planned between the cold weather and high water runoff. There is a narrow window of opportunity in April and early May. Then the water gets too high to safely run the river. But by mid-June, the most popular season on the salmon is in full swing. The salmon in the springtime is so unknown to people. It is so un unappreciated as a recreational activity that you really are alone out here. You really do have the river to yourself. He says this is probably what the pioneers who came down this river a hundred years ago saw. Awe-inspiring scenery and a noticeable lack of people. Today the scenery is just as awesome and the people just as scarce. The scenic beauty, uh, the peacefulness. I lived in Salmon you know, all my life and I was just thinking, gee, many of you know, a person needs to do this more often. And I'd certainly encourage uh, you know, all the people of Idaho especially, this is a resource that's, that's right here in our backyard and we need to spend more time. In. While the weather can be somewhat unpredictable, you won't hear many complaints. With the right clothes, a little weather is tolerable. Of course, a dip in the hot springs doesn't hurt either. 
feels beautiful. It's wonderful. It's, it's rough. <laughs> this is always rough in here. <laughs> this water is really this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> The pace this time of year is pretty relaxed. When Wayne Johnson plans these trips, he makes sure there's enough time to take a few side trips to explore the history of the area. Jim Moore's mining camp is one of Johnson's favorite spots. Most of the buildings put up in the late 1800s are still here. In fact, a group of archeologists is now working to restore this historic site. He built all these cabins by himself with the exception of the one to my right here, his home. He had help from another fellow for about two weeks, but all the other cabins here he built by himself except that he had two horses to help him drag the logs. This mining camp is a living piece of Idaho history, history that guides like Wayne Johnson keep alive by sharing it with their guests. It's more than whitewater. It's a, it's a time machine trip uh, for people to see and touch and feel and, and uh, have a personal experience with our with our heritage. Paddle hard! Paddle hard! Very good. Okay, hold your paddles. You're wondering if you're gonna flip over and if you're hitting it right and if your guides are <laughs> steering you right and if you're gonna end up right side up, but it's always a thrill. It's fun. I love going through those rapids and um, no matter how cold it is, it doesn't matter because you're have, just having so much fun that it just doesn't matter. I like it up front. It's more fun. You get to see firsthand and you're just right there. Many spring trips end up in places like the China Bar Lodge. After a long day of rafting and sightseeing, a hot shower and warm bed are just the ticket. Throw in a late night bonfire under the moonlit sky and you've just wrapped up the perfect day. Paradise, found in the heart of Idaho's wilderness. <laughs> and while spring is a gorgeous time to be on the river, summer is still the most popular season on the salmon and there are plenty of Idaho guides and outfitters willing to share this unique Idaho experience with you. A new vacation craze is sweeping the west, and it's a really interesting concept. You spend a few days mending and building fences, chasing after cattle, and in general, working until you are dog tired. And on top of that, you pay someone to let you do it. In case you haven't figured it out, we're talking about a dude ranch vacation. And as Exploring Idaho's David Mills found out, the real cowboys at the Mountain Man Lodge in southwestern Idaho are always looking for a few good buckaroos. Sunrise at the Rockingham Ranch. It's only 32 miles to the town of Weezer from here, but you'd swear you were days from anywhere. I guess that's part of the mystique of this place, but there's something else that makes the Rockingham Ranch unique. It's one of just a handful of Idaho dude ranches. Morning comes early at the ranch, a little too early for my taste. But if you're going to live the life of a cowboy, you might as well do it right. The dude ranch experience is a lot of fun. Here you go, Dave. It's, it's part of the Old West that is, is not experienced by many people anymore. And we're, we're giving the public a chance to, to come really rough it. This is what the West was. About the only thing that's changed is now people call this a vacation. Well, like on any good ranch, there are literally miles and miles of fence. And this time of year, after a long, hard winter, a lot of it's broken down. That's where I come in. This is one of the things you can come out and experience is building corrals, digging post holes, fixing fence is all part of everyday ranch life. Let it slide down. Okay. Slider. Piece of cake. And I thought this ranch stuff was going to be tough. Oh. I guess the secret is to... This city kid is about to get a lesson in the fine art of post hole digging. And Rex and Charlie Moore are just the guys to show me how it's done. They grew up on this ranch. Okay. That's it. Harder. Harder. 
So he's pretty solid. It looks good, Dave. Now only 150 more to go. Right towards the head of the animal. I don't know. Maybe I'm better suited for the real cowboy stuff, like roping. See, get, see the feel, the wrist action now, just like that. Or maybe not. But hey, Rome wasn't built in a day. Good, good, not bad for a beginner. When it was finally time to ride, I had my choice of horses. There was lightning, thunder, tornado, and the one I picked, Squirt. He's a trusty Steve, been working cattle on this ranch for years. I didn't let on that this was my first time, although I think he might have sensed it. Oh, oh, whoa. <laughs> this is about as close as you can get to some of those stories of, of riding horses and being able to look out across the landscape and not see a house or a building or a telephone line. Or bathroom or pot machine. This is tough. What we want to offer to people is a chance during our spring and fall roundups to come out and experience it and ride in the mountains and gather the cattle, work the cattle. And cattle gathering in these parts is easier said than done. This is rugged, unforgiving country. Kind of makes you wonder why the cattle would want to come here in the first place. This is some fairly steep stuff here. You always really want to turn your horse downhill. If you're going to turn around, don't face your horse uphill when you turn around, because they can go over backwards on you if they get in a problem. He would wait until we were halfway up the mountain to give me that little piece of information. Turn around. Come on. You really need to go down there. Let's go get him. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. to do this. You bet. They pay you to work. It's an interesting concept, I know. Uh, we've been paying people to do it for years and years as ranch hands, and we're giving people a chance to learn and really dig their hands into it, and they really enjoy themselves. Well, after a day like that, you really appreciate coming back to a place like this. At the end of the day, you're tired and you're bone tired. You realize that if you did this day in and day out, it would surely toughen you up and make you appreciate this kind of work and this kind of lifestyle. So if you don't mind a little hard work, wide open spaces, and spending some time in the saddle, a dude ranch vacation may be just what the doctor ordered. We'll be right back. I want you to picture this, a lake so blue it almost doesn't look real. A lake so clear you can watch the fish swimming below your boat. In this day and age, places like that are hard to find. But in southeast Idaho, the folks can tell you about their favorite lake. They call it unbelievable. You see, the place is called Bear Lake. So hitch up your boat, grab your fishing rod, and head to Idaho's southeastern corner to discover Bear Lake country. Bear Lake. At 110 square miles, it's one of the largest inland lakes in the west. Look over the side of your boat. The view is crystal clear. A lot of people have said it looks like the Sea of Galilee. It's got the same colors, and it's got the color of a lot of high glacial lakes that we see in Canada and other places. The water, the water is just so pristine blue, and it changes. It's so dynamic. If you sit above the lake on any day like this when you've got a few clouds, you'll see this lake go from a dark blue to a light turquoise, and 
and just glisten and sparkle, and, and it's just a dynamic feature, and it almost looks artificial. It's so blue. Even though it sits in a valley, Bear Lake is still considered a high mountain lake. The elevation here, 6,000 feet. With all this water, Bear Lake is a giant playground for boaters and jet skiers. Anglers love it too. Bear Lake is home to four species of fish found nowhere else in the world, including the Bear Lake cutthroat. The fishing on Bear Lake uh, at times of the year are, are absolutely fantastic. You can always be assured of a possibility of catching a record fish here, including the Bear Lake cutthroat, which is only found uh, in these waters. They have been taken to other waters in other states, but here it is only found naturally. Uh, there are also lake trout in here that can range up to 25 pounds, 30 pounds. There, there is always that opportunity to catch that big fish. But even more than the fishing, most folks simply enjoy the scenery. It's unsurpassed. If you don't believe it, just ask Esther Harrison. She runs a bed and breakfast inn overlooking the lake. During the summer, she spends hours on end in her raspberry patch. Thanks to cool nights and warm days, the raspberries grow like weeds up here. Her guests can get in on the act, too, but she says most folks eat more than they pick. It's incredible. People have to come and see it for themselves, though. After they've once seen it, um, it sells itself. You don't have to tell them anything about it. But right now, if they haven't seen it, you tell them that it's close to the mountains and close to the lake and all alone, and it's incredibly quiet. If it's peace and quiet you're looking for, head just a few miles north, and you'll find even more at the Minnetonka Cave. Discovered by a hunter in the early 1900s, today thousands more are discovering this mammoth cave thanks to Forest Service tours. Workers installed steps and handrails throughout the cave back in the 30s, and later a lighting system was installed. Minnetonka is a high mountain cave. It's a chilly 40 degrees all year round. And what you'll see inside is almost surreal. Thousands of stalagmites rising from the floor and stalactites hanging like icicles from the ceiling. I like to go through the cave without a tour occasionally and stop and you can just find all sorts of interesting things. I uh, especially like to stop and look at the fossils that are in here and uh, there's just formations everywhere. Every time you go through you see something that you haven't seen before. Also I like to experience the sounds of the cave when there's not anyone in here. Uh, very interesting, all of the dripping water. The hour and a half tour is an adventure worth the trip. Caves like this one are far and few between. Just down the highway from the Minnetonka Cave is the town of Paris. Not France, but Paris, Idaho. You won't find an Eiffel Tower in this Paris, but you will find century-old houses and other buildings, most listed on the National Register of Historic Places. A self-guided walking or driving tour of the town gives you a taste of what this area was like at the turn of the century. Throughout Paris, you'll find architectural heritage at its best. The centerpiece is the Paris Tabernacle, built back in 1889. This Romanesque Mormon tabernacle is built of red sandstone that was brought in on snow sleds from a quarry 18 miles away. Despite the heavy Mormon influence during those early days, a few folks took another road, Ever hear of a guy named Butch Cassidy? Well, around here, he's still the talk of the town, even though it's been nearly a hundred years since he brandished his pistol at the bank of Montpelier. A three-man gang led by Cassidy made off with $5,000. Butch Cassidy was never caught. In fact, occasionally, he can still be spotted around Montpelier. And a Japanese camera, huh? Is that worth anything? <laughs> Thanks to a few local history buffs, the legend of Butch Cassidy is kept alive. After all, he may well be one of the most famous folks to ever pass through these parts. But every year, more and more people are discovering all Bear Lake Country has to offer. And by the way, the fishing is especially good during the winter. The winter frost begins the yearly spawning run of the Bonneville Cisco, another fish found only in Bear Lake. They say once you learn to ride a bike, you never forget. But if you haven't seen what they're riding these days, you may be in for a big surprise. Even more surprising, where they're riding these fancy new bikes. It's called mountain biking, and it's easily the fastest growing sport in Idaho. These rugged bikes with their wide tires let you go where bikes have never gone before. And one North Idaho ski resort is getting in on the action. 
As Exploring Idaho's David Mills shows us, during the summer, the folks at Silver Mountain trade in their skis for bikes. Kellogg, in the heart of Idaho's Silver Valley. It's home to the state's newest ski resort, Silver Mountain, and boasts the world's longest gondola. Already, this place has earned a reputation for superb skiing, but when the snow melts and the skis are in the closet, this year-round resort doesn't go to sleep. It's one of the Northwest's premier spots for mountain biking. Hey, hop right in, put your feet up on the seat the long way. There are a few better ways to spend a summer day than taking a nice, leisurely bike ride, but that's not exactly what we're in store for. Once aboard Silver Mountain's 3.1-mile gondola, you've got time to relax and enjoy the view. And it is spectacular. You can see for miles in every direction. Thousands of tourists come here every year just to enjoy this 20-minute ride. But for us, the adventure has just begun. 100 miles of trail traverse the mountain. If you're into mountain biking, this is the place for you. Technology has made it just more efficient. It's actually made the sport easier and more enjoyable for a wider range of people. The right equipment makes a big difference. Some of the trails are rough and tough, and you'll want to make sure you're prepared. And don't forget your helmet. It's required equipment. The six main trails here vary. Some are easier than others. A couple will get you down the mountain quickly. Well, the longest, 22 miles, takes several hours. Uh, this is the Big Creek Trail. Uh, this one's 18 miles long, goes from the mountain house down past the Sunshine Mine and Big Creek itself, and then follows the frontage road back to the base terminal. One of the best things about biking here at Silver Mountain is that once you've taken the gondola to the top of the hill, the ride down is pretty easy. About 95% of it is on a downhill grade. Just about anybody can handle it, so long as you keep your bike in control. We get quite a diversity of people up here because they can ride the gondola from young to old to beginner, experienced, quite a variety because we have trails for everybody and a little bit of uh, variety that even the hardcore riders really enjoy. Speed is what I really like, going down completing a good, fast run, and getting to the bottom without wrecking. For me, just staying on the bike is challenging enough, much less hitting 30 to 40 miles an hour. It's easy to do on some of the smoother downhill grades, but you'll want to slow down anyway. There's plenty to see. This is looking down into the Big Creek drainage. This is the Big Creek golf course, and looking down across um, at one of the gulches, Montgomery Gulch, that goes up on the other side. All the little ravines here are filled with little housing projects like that from the mining days. Depending on the trail you pick, some of the riding can be a little tricky. And while you should be keeping your eyes on the road, with scenery like this, it's not very easy. It's pretty much the top of the world, you know. It's a beautiful place. It doesn't get boring because things always change, the flora and the fauna. You know, it's always moving, changing, the rocks are moving, there's different flowers, different times of the year, and there's always the wildlife and just the scenery to look at. Today's new breed of mountain bikes have opened up a whole new form of outdoor recreation. It's a great all-around sport. It gives you the freedom to go where you want to go and see some country that is otherwise hidden. Oh, I think it's tremendous. Um, I can't see anywhere else that it's any better than this uh, as far as overall opportunities, the miles of roads that you can ride, as well uh, as a superb system like this of getting up the hill and then getting down without as much effort. And there's an added benefit. This is the best kind of stress relief uh, that that man has found in my mind. Of course, there are hundreds of miles of trails throughout Idaho. Local bike shops can usually tell you the best places to go and recommend the type of bike you'll need.
Did you know a part of Yellowstone Park is located in Idaho? It's called Island Park, and before you visit Yellowstone, you really should see it for yourself. The scenic highway runs along Idaho's eastern border, and just driving that road tells you there's something very special about this spot. The pristine waters of the Henry's Fork, the occasional moose by the side of the road, and an excellent view of the Teton Mountains. Now just imagine if you'd take just a little time to really check out this place. That's exactly what David Mills did. Tucked in the toe of northeastern Idaho, Island Park is a vacation wonderland. And one of the best ways to take advantage of all this area has to offer is to pack up the RV and head down the road. We're on eastern Idaho's Highway 20. It's known as the gateway to Yellowstone. That's because millions of folks travel this road on their way to the National Park. But in their haste to get to Old Faithful, they miss out on some real Idaho treasures just off the road. We don't stay on Highway 20 for long. Our journey takes us off on a side road, the Mesa Falls Scenic Byway. The drive takes us past a magnificent view of the Grand Tetons, through forested country, and eventually to Lower Mesa Falls. Here, the waters of the Henry's Fork plunge 65 feet it's an awesome spectacle of the power behind this usually serene river. But Lower Mesa Falls offers only a taste of what's in store just a mile down the road. The Upper Falls is a place where the locals will travel to time and time again, and it's easy to see why. It's a very serene place in spite of all the noise from the waterfall, and uh, it's a very exciting, vibrant place at the same time and uh, very special, very special. Back on the byway, you'll want to keep your eyes peeled for some wildlife. You might see a deer peering through some branches, a moose and calf nestled on the ground, or even an eagle perched atop a tree. Once back on Highway 20, there's another place worth checking into. It's Harriman State Park. Harriman State Park was given to Idaho by the Harriman family, who originally built it as a working ranch and private retreat. You don't have to be a millionaire to enjoy this place anymore. Just look around. It won't be long before you figure out why the Harrimans, who could have built just about anywhere, decided on this place. The Harriman family, who owned Union Pacific Railroad, built this ranch in the early 1900s. It remained in the family for years, before being donated to the state of Idaho in the 70s. Although developed as a state park, most of the original flavor of the railroad ranch is still alive. The impression we we're trying to get here is that the, the Harrimans have just left for the day or are out riding horses or what have you. And uh, so the place is relatively uh, furnished completely with uh, uh, that intent, but they still are here. A guided tour of Harriman's historic buildings offers a rare glimpse into the private lives of one of our country's wealthiest families. This year, two and a half million people will crowd into Yellowstone National Park. It's just down the road from here. Almost all those folks will drive past Harriman on their way there. But only about 1% will actually stop at this park. What they're missing is a piece of living history. Of course, one of the things that attracted the Harrimans to Island Park and still entices visitors today is the Henry's Fork of the Snake River, world renowned for its fly fishing. More than half the visitors at Harriman come here to fish. It's an angler's paradise. This is another place you're sure to see wildlife, and if you've ever wanted to see a moose, this is the spot. In just a couple of hours, we spotted six. Harriman is also a sanctuary for the endangered trumpeter swan. While they mostly winter in this area, a good number spend the entire year here. Of course, one of the greatest things about this RV experience is once you're tired and ready to turn in for the night, We've well, already got your room. All you need is a place to park it. That's where a campground directory like this one comes in handy. It tells you where you can park all over Idaho. 
There's certainly not a lack of camping sites at Island Park. The biggest problem is choosing where you want to stay. One of the most popular spots for RVers at Island Park is Henry's Lake State Park. Come on, fish. Once you're settled in, grab your fishing rod. At Henry's Lake, folks say the fish practically jump on your hook. Big old cutthroat. Probably 22, 23 inches. Visit Island Park and you'll be hooked too. It's a place worth coming back to time and time again. Now the locals recommend you visit Island Park during the off season. Spring, fall, and winter are spectacular. There's only one thing missing, the crowds. Now let's head back down the road to south central Idaho, near the Utah border. Here you'll find a most unusual city. Miles from any telephones or even electricity, there are towering skyscrapers. It's called the City of Rocks, and the name really says it all. These skyscrapers are an uncommon collection of massive granite sculptures. It's a great place for camping, picnicking, or just exploring. And if you visit the city, you'll have plenty of company. It's one of the most popular rock climbing spots in the world. We caught up with a group of climbers who said they'd live there if they could. Gemini, Energizer, Calypso. A trip to the City of Rocks is kind of like going to a theme park. The theme here, rock climbing. And those interesting names are just a few of the hundreds of different routes climbers from all over the world have discovered right here in Idaho. We're really lucky here that we have this. A lot of people don't have an area like this. They have to fly eight hours or drive from the east. But living here in Idaho, that, it, it feels special. And that's why I've always stayed here. And I think I'll always will live here. Away we go. Jeff Rhodes and his wife Kelly are veteran climbers. They've been at it nearly 20 years. And in that time, they've managed to introduce others to the sport. Folks like Sue McButch and her son Riley. Hey, Mom, up and left. Okay. Up and left. There's a big jug. Okay. Sue began climbing three years ago. And since it's a sport that requires a partner, she decided to see if Riley wanted to give it a shot. He's hooked. I'm really proud of Riley. When we started, it was like he was just, he was so much smaller than I was. I had kind of just a, a height advantage on him. And now that he's grown a little bit in the last few years, his climbing has just taken off. I mean, he's leaving me in the dust. <laughs> He takes the sport so seriously that he's even built a special climbing wall in the basement of his parents' house. So when he can't get out and do the real thing, Riley can still get in a climbing workout. The main thing about people when they first start climbing, no matter what age, is they always rely on their arms so much. And they don't think about technique. And the good thing at Riley is he's real intelligent. And he's picked up some pretty advanced techniques real quickly and that makes a that makes a real big difference because when you start doing harder climbs you have to uh, you know without good technique you burn out faster and you can't hang on but if you've got real good technique you can save a lot of energy a lot of times when it looks like it's really hard definitely wouldn't want to fall off on this slab you'd go for quite a ways Rhodes says climbing gives you both a physical and mental workout. While overall body strength is important, you don't need to be an Iron Man. More importantly, you need to think. Plan each move before you make it. Go up, grab it, high step into the hole, and go up. A lot of what happens once you're up here is problem solving. What to do when you get in a tight spot. How to get from point A to point B without getting hurt. In some cases, that's easier said than done. Take this overhang, for instance. Climbers call it a roof. Before he gets over it, Jeff will find himself hanging upside down. You're under a big roof, and your arms are getting tired, and you don't know if you're going to be able to hang on. You can't find anything for your feet. And, and you pull up a little bit, and you look over, and you'll see a, just a really nice handhold up there. And you've got to figure out, well, how am I going to get to it? And so you just start doing all these weird body motions and reach up and grab that handhold and you know you're going to make it. <laughs> a 
And getting there is made easier thanks to some unique equipment, like these special shoes with sticky rubber soles. But the most important part of any climbing experience is the person at the other end of the rope. The climber's life can depend on the belayer. As the climber makes his way up the rock, the rope is placed through metal loops called quick draws. These quick draws are clipped to bolts anchored in the rock. That way, if the climber slips, he won't have far to fall. The belayer simply tightens the rope and brings his partner back to safety. Excellent climb. You'll, you'll have no problem with it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to come right over there. There we go. Thank you, Riley. Good belay. At age 14, Riley is well on his way to becoming a world-class climber. It's something that consumes his life. When most kids his age would rather be playing video games or cruising the mall, Riley is at home dangling from a rope on the side of a cliff. It's fun. You try harder stuff. Get on harder and harder stuff. It's more challenging for you. You learn to, to work it out and not to freak out. And when you get finished and you get down, it's like, God, I did that. It was great. All right, Spider-Man, good job. That's a fun one, isn't it? But take note, if you plan to get into rock climbing, it can be addictive. Luckily, with places like the City of Rocks, there will always be something new to discover. It's a beautiful environment. I think we're really lucky to have it here in Idaho. And don't forget, the City of Rocks isn't just for rock climbers. Those who prefer to keep their feet on the ground will enjoy a visit as well. Oh, the leaves are falling. First leaves I've seen. Hey, the leaves are falling. Look at that. That's great, huh? First leaves. Autumn is the time of year when we find ourselves longing for a lazy afternoon with plenty of time to go for a walk and feast on the spectacular colors of fall. It's a great time to go exploring Idaho. And perhaps nowhere in the state are the colors more rich, more vibrant, or breathtaking than central Idaho's Wood River Valley. Exploring Idaho's John Patterson not only shows us the changing leaves, he helps us appreciate them through the eye of one well-trained observer. They are fleeting with us for only a short time. Fiery reds and shimmering golds, the colors of Idaho's autumn. It is nature's final show, a brief burst of brilliance before a barren winter. There are many places in our state to view this colorful display, but no stage is more spectacular than the resort community of Sun Valley. Look at the leaves are falling. First leaves I've seen. Hey, the leaves are falling. Look at that. That's great, huh? First leaves. Little breeze. That starts to go, boy. That's going to take them. For the last 15 years, professional photographer Jack Williams has made Sun Valley his home. This nationally acclaimed photographer has seen his pictures on the cover of such magazines as Sunset and Snow Country. OK, anytime you're ready, girls. Good. On this day, Jack's taken us up Trail Creek, one of his favorite locations, at the peak time of his favorite season. Ooh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful, that 200 on. Boy, it's a humdinger rooney. For a man who's taken so many pictures of autumn, you'd think all this would become routine. Not so. Listen to the excitement in Jack's voice as he describes what he loves best about autumn. It's all very peaceful and it's magical. It's getting ready for winter. Everything's tucking away. And it's very magical. People say, why is it, is, what's, what, what is it that makes it that light? And the light is so low and cutting across things. And, the, the, and the, all the grasses are translucent. You get that low translucent light. And it's just, and by a stream you'll stand, the water will be very clear and crispy, you know, and the gold underneath. Over the years, Jack's taken countless pictures of autumn in Sun Valley. There have been many good years and some mediocre ones, 
But Jack says no year has been more colorful than this one. I thought I had seen it, but this year, and this year is the best because like it's got a fullness. All the leaves are still there. A few are dropping to kind of coat the road. But right now we have this whole range of tones. Put that filter. Oh, that's excellent. Now that's excellent. What is it about this time, this season, that commands our attention? It is perhaps the same force that compels Jack Williams to photograph it. It's warm in your front and cool in the backside, the crunch of autumn leaves. It's Hemingway-ish, yeah. you know, like down his statue where he says, best of all, he loved the fall, you know, it's just haunting. It's magic. It's like a, a tuck-away time. You know? It takes only a moment to glimpse the beauty of autumn. Look at these colors. Every year, nature puts on this magical show, but sometimes it takes people like Jack Williams to help us appreciate it. There was a time when Jack thought he might never see another Sun Valley autumn. Two years ago, he underwent open heart surgery. Not easy for a man used to spending the majority of his time outdoors. The surgery was successful, and Jack clearly remembers the day he finally came home. Coming out of all this after a few months of being in the hospital room, and, 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 you know, it was wonderful, but the air was always the same. And I just wanted anything for that smell of rain and little droplets. And when I got out, came back here and went front over Galena Summit, you know, yeah. and here is these big, old, ancient fur, you know, stuff like that. And I looked at it and thought, I'm seeing this again, and I might never see it again. When you think of it in that context, it's really, wow. Smile is the happier age. That's, that's it. Oh, that's cute. What I like to do is get the, the beauty of the Idaho, the, the power of it, and then the people out there enjoying it. The, the freshness of the faces and the vigor that you get in people living in this country is, is just wonderful. Because people love it. That's why they're here. They are fleeting, with us for only a short time. Photographer and philosopher Jack Williams knows that. And thankfully, he's given us some images to help us remember another Idaho autumn. Ooh, that's pretty. Isn't that gorgeous? Fall is also a great time to head to Idaho's Hell's Canyon, south of Lewiston. Not only for its beauty, but for its great fishing, too. It's your chance to hook into an Idaho steelhead. It is the deepest canyon in North America. It is here the Snake River carves its way through some rugged, yet breathtaking country. Idaho's Hell's Canyon is a jewel in the Gem State. And even as gorgeous as this place is, there's one more thing that beckons folks to this canyon, the chance to hook into an Idaho steelhead. Ah! <laughs> This is what we're waiting for. It's quite a thrill to be able to fight one of these fish. It's like an electric shock. <laughs> this is about what it is, feels like. Okay. Look at that, there he goes again. Rod Paul has been fishing for steelhead here for the past five years or so. He says it's something you just never grow tired of. Fishing guide Alan Lamb is convinced he's got the greatest job around. This Idaho native says he's been fishing this river since he was knee-high to a steelhead. Today, he gets pleasure out of watching others reel in their catch. <laughs> All right. I think it's more fun for me to watch somebody else catch a fish, especially somebody that never has caught a fish before. In fact, I probably get more excited for them than they actually do. That's something that I think that everybody should experience if they could. That's a rush and a half. Waited all day for that. Uh, arms tired. Whew. That's what it's all about. It's also about knowing where the fish are. And if you really want to catch them, you'll need a way to get around. Jet boats on the snake are as common as cars on the highway. But guides like Alan Lamb aren't so easy to come by. 
he works his way up and down the river, fishing his favorite holes. Okay, Dave, we're going to give you this pink one here. And uh, the only reason I'm choosing this one, it's kind of a reflecting pink color, and I'm hoping that's going to catch one of them's eye. Alan knows his stuff and shares it with folks from all over the world. He's pretty busy this time of year. The fall steelhead runs attract seasoned anglers as well as newcomers. We get a lot of people that have never been out here fishing before uh, or maybe never even fished before that come out. And uh, actually the fishing is just the upside of the whole trip. The scenery is probably one of the biggest items most people are amazed with. As nice as this place is, I've got to be honest with you, there's only one thing on my mind, catching fish. All right. Reeling in a steelhead isn't always easy. They average about 12 pounds, to say the least you know when you've hooked into one. You can't muscle the fish in, you run a risk of losing him. Finesse the fish, let him come to you. Woohoo! All right. All right. There. Okay, he's a wild fish, he's got an out of pose pen right here. There's a mixture of hatchery raised and native steelhead out here. The natives are strictly catch and release and increasing populations of these fighters make your chances of hooking into one pretty good. Yeah, we try to make it uh, something that somebody can come out here and relax. Uh, we don't get too high pressured. Uh, the fish are there and we're catching fish, then we're catching fish and having a good time. If not, we're looking at the country and, and still having a good time. You can't see this place like this from your living room. It's free. You're free. Any time you're out here. And you can't, can't that's something really you can't describe. There's some bighorn sheep tracks following along the river, probably up ahead here someplace. About the only place in the country you can get that close to wild animals and get pictures of them and not have them that scared of you. There's no another place around like it. Places like this are rare, almost as rare as being assured you'll catch a steelhead. But sometimes, things just work out. Holy duck! Oh, all right! <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Oh, oh, nice. Oh, my God. <laughs> Did you see it? There we go. We got him. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Someone take this pole out of my hand. <laughs> Fun to watch. Somebody get that excited over a fish. <laughs> Not just a fish. No. Not just it's a, a fish, fish, it's a whale! <laughs> now that's a keeper. All right, congratulations. Great job, cool. good job. Rest assured, there is no better way to end a day. Idaho steelhead season is usually pretty strong right on through the first of the year. We'll be right back. Our time exploring Idaho is almost up and we have only begun to show you all Idaho has to offer. But hold on, we have a few more things to show you. Our photographer Bill Crum put together some favorite pictures from his travels exploring Idaho.
for being with us, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next month with a brand new edition of Exploring Idaho. Thank you.